Sue, you read Richard Dawkins' book, The Selfish Gene, in which he writes about memes, and you develop the concept further. Could you tell us about this? Yeah, well, in the beginning, back in 1976, when The Selfish Gene came out, I didn't really notice it much. It was many years later, when Dan Dennett took up the idea of, of memes, that I got really engrossed. So, in The Selfish Gene, what Dawkins is trying to do there is elaborate the concept of what he calls universal Darwinism. That's the idea that, it's a very simple logical idea. If you've got any kind of information that is copied lots of times, but the copies are slightly different, and then you have selection so that only one of them gets copied again, and then the same process keeps happening, keeps happening, you get design out of nowhere. That's how we know biology works. That's, the, that's what Darwin saw with his principle of natural selection. But what Dawkins was trying to do was to say, this is not a process that applies only to genes, it applies to any information that is copied in, in that way. And that information will just selfishly replicate itself. Um, and selfish here doesn't mean that the information is kind of like going, I want, I want, it's just, it can't help it. It's an inevitable process. And he wanted to clarify this, so he said, are there any other replicators, any other information like this on planet Earth? Um, well, um, you know, we mustn't get hooked up on genes. What else is there? Oh, every time we copy words, stories, um, ideas, ways of making things, um, from person to person, some of those ideas and ways of doing things get copied on again and again and improve as they get copied by this selection process and others just die out. It's the same process happening. So he said we need a name for this new replicator and he took it from the Greek for my meme which means that which is imitated or that which is copied and that's the meme. He shortened it to meme. Mm -hmm. And it's an extraordinarily powerful idea. It, it kind of bothers me that we're going back to 1976 that he invented this idea and memetics, the science of, of memes, has never really taken off. But nowadays everybody knows what an internet meme is and it's a really good example of this kind of information. You know, endless pictures of cats are stuck out there on the internet and some are just so cute they get copied again and again. Some endless horrible stories and ghastly pornographies out there and some of it appeals enough to certain people they keep passing it on and they succeed and other things just fizzle out. So that shows you the principle of evolution at work on, on memes. And the important thing is that internet memes are just one example. All this stuff, I mean look at this beautiful, beautiful sofa thing. That pattern will have been copied again and again and this one, this particular one is here because you bought it, I suppose, um, but its origin lies in all the previous ones that have been made and developed through culture. And all of culture, and all our words, and all our stories, and all our songs, they are all information that has succeeded by being copied by us human meme machines. So that's the basic idea. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a really powerful idea. Right. Now you come up with the idea of teams or trains. Tell mm. us about that. Well, I, 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 I wrote a book in 1999 called um, The Meme Machine and I did my best to understand about human memes, us copying things between each other. But as the years went by, you know, so much has changed, hasn't it, since 1999. We're talking nearly 20 years now. And the world of electronic information has just... Well, that's what happens in evolutionary processes, isn't it? You know, they start small. You start with bacteria-like things, and you know, they, and we end up with elephants and humans and cats and wings and fur and eyes, and they go faster and faster and faster. And I was thinking, is all this electronic information, this digital information, all the stuff out in cyberspace, all the stuff in Facebook and Twitter and websites and all of this, is it just more memes? Are we, should we just think of it as more human stuff that we're copying, or could it sort of? Could it be some? Could it be a third replicator? Could it be taking off out of our control, with all the processes of copying, varying, and selecting going on out there in in cyberspace? It would all depend on the computers and servers and phones that we've built. But is it a new replicator? And thinking about that, I mean, I don't think there's exactly an answer to whether we should call it a new replicator or not. But I think we really, really need to be alert to what's going on. So my view now is that. All of this information that is going into the machines that we're so 
enthusiastically building that we think we're building for ourselves. We think we invented <clears throat> Twitter and Facebook and things for our own pleasure. It's really happening because the selfish information will always get copied whenever it can. And it can if enough humans will let it. But it's doing it in its, for its own sake, not for ours. And it's proliferating way out of our control. And that's why I thought, well, if it really is out of our control, we should give it a new name. New name. So I, I said teams, but then people spelt it wrong and thought I was talking about football. So I thought dreams for like try, you know, for the third replicator. But what I mean by dreams is all of that electronic information. And it's behaving just as you would expect it to behave from a new evolutionary process. So I imagine it like this, this massive cascade of digital information. We're still necessary because we have to build the servers and the computers and the phones. And we have to dig up the oil and the gas and, uh, and, and, and all the minerals and metals that are required to build this stuff. But it's like a massive extraction process. This information just being copied and copied and copied, causing us to do all this. And we are stupidly thinking that we're in control and that it's making us happy. And look around. You said to me the other day that you went into a cafe and thought, like in the old days, if you went on your own in a cafe, you'd sort of end up chatting with somebody and you'd sit around and enjoy the people. And you know. All that happens now is everyone's did 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 Everyone's kind of isolating themselves. It's not making us happy. And kids are getting more depression, anxiety, and overload. So it's manifestly obvious that even though we think we made it for ourselves, it's not actually benefiting us. It's benefiting the information itself, which is expanding massively. Mm -hmm. It's just a terribly depressing way of thinking about things. I don't know, but if it's realistic, at least I think it's, re it, it's worth trying to understand it and trying to ask the question, is this really what's going on? And if it is, how are we going to understand it and, and cope with it in the future? So you're suggesting that perhaps the dreams are affecting us in a very negative way. I think about Facebook, you know, and on Facebook people present a persona about themselves which they want other people to accept, but it's often a persona that is unreal. Yeah. So are people becoming less real, do you suppose? Well, they're becoming more... It depends what, what it means for a person to be real. For a person to be real and authentic, authentic yes. yes, authentic, um, I think comes down to being here, present, having your eyes open and your relationships with other people to mm -hmm. be immediate. Mm -hmm. and, and it's taking us away from that, but it's also making us more complicated. And if you think about the effects of meditation or mindfulness, which are about simplifying the self, dropping away all the accretions of I want this and I need that and I must be important and I must be famous and people must like me and all of that those things when they drop away lead to joy mm -hmm. <laughs> a sense of freedom but at its simplest just more contentment and all this stuff is going in exactly the op opposite direction making it more important for other people to like you I mean literally like how many likes you've got um, and, and that you're more important you've got more um, followers, you, you know, status. Um, yes, it's, it's taking us away from, I would think, natural human contentment. Mm -hmm. And if you, I mean, I love the fact that through Facebook I got in touch with a couple of people that I knew a long time ago I might never have done before, that by looking people up online you can find, there's wonderful things and this is what keeps us going, it is fantastic. But, inadvertently, as it were, all these other things are happening. And if I go back to your your, your thought about the cafe, um, when you're communicating with somebody through your phone, it's extremely useful. You know, I can now tell people whether I'm at the airport or not and what time I'm going to get somewhere. It's so useful. But when you're doing that and communicating someone at a distance, most of the natural human capacity to communicate that we have is absent. It's just the words or the pictures that we send. You haven't got the body language, you haven't got the feeling of empathy, you haven't got the processes where two people sitting in a cafe with a cup of coffee, they will move in, in synchrony with each other. They'll see each other's smiles, they'll feel things, they'll feel empathically with the other person and the conversations are, are rich and deep and there's more to, than just the words. And that's overlaid by us all sitting there going, da, 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 this is so important. So I think we're losing, we lose, we lose quite a lot and we gain quite a lot. What's the balance? What, you know? 
what worries me when I and interests me when I think about dreams is we should, if that's the right way of thinking about it, we should be able to ask questions like, is it actually worse or better? Is it a price worth paying? Is the lack of privacy or is the communication, or, um, the, the harm that this might be doing, a price worth paying for the benefit we get? I guess most people would say, well, that's why it happens. But taking it from the selfish replicator point of view, we'd say the, the prime mover is that information itself. We better watch out, we better ask questions about what it's doing to us and not just assume that because we think we invented it, um, we're in control and it's for our benefit. Because I don't think it is. Sue, thank you. Good, that was short enough to be <clears throat> to get the main thrust over without going off into too much. Do you agree? Yes. <laughs>